Thank you that the ground is level at the foot of the cross where we can all come. May we find the true meaning and the victory that is ours because of what Jesus accomplished there. That he conquered death, that he rose from the dead so that we could be victors over the things that we're walking through. God, uh, push us towards the cross this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, we are starting a brand new section of the, of the book of Revelation, uh, chapters uh, 12 through 22. We really have started a, a, a new series today to take us through Labor Day called uh, Called to Duty, It's Time for Death to Die. Um, we're we're going to go through uh, chapter 12, 13, 14, part of chapter 15 this morning, and, and, I, and, I, and I need a few things from you. I, I need you in just a moment, I'm going to read chapter 12, 13, 14, part of 15, and I need you to close your Bibles, and it's not going to be on the screen, and I need you to resist the temptation to read along with me. I, I need you to listen. Uh, the Chapter 1 of Revelation says that those who hear this read aloud are blessed. I don't want you to miss out on that blessing. But I also want you to put your mind in the, uh, in the mindset of those first hearers. They, they, they would have heard it read. They wouldn't have had time to go back and with a fine-tooth comb go through all the symbols and all the numbers and all the imagery and all of the things. They're going to grab a hold of, a, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to grab a hold of, of some central truths. And they've already been through listening uh, to what we call Revelation 1 through 11, and there's a couple of simple, central truths that they've held on to, that there's a throne and that there's one seated on it and, and he's victorious and he's sovereign and he's holy and he's faithful and he's just and, and he reigns and that their God reigns. They're going to understand that there's a throne as the central image and they're going to understand, they're going to hear repeated over and over and over again as this is read out loud, one word and it's what you know as Nike. It's the, the, the clothing line, it's the shoe company and it, it stands for victory and over and over again they're going to be, the one who sits on the throne is victorious and victorious and victorious and why he's victorious is because of what he's already done on the cross. One of the pictures is he's, he's standing in front of the throne Roman. He's, he's a lamb that was slain, but he's standing, and they're going to understand, and they're going to have gone through chapter uh, 1 through 3, and they're going to see there were seven churches, and that the church is called to stand, uh, to shine as light in, a, in the midst of a world that lies in darkness. Chapters 4 through 7, they're going to understand that, that, that darkness hates the light, so conflict is unavoidable on planet Earth. And there are going to be seven seals, a scroll with seven seals, and they're going to be unbroken one at a time, and it's going to point them back to the cross. And then they're going to understand that, that God's judgment is coming as it sounds, these seven trumpets that, that give one last chance at warning. And what we see as we move through these seven sections of Revelation, they're, they're parallel sections that, that cover the beginning, the first time Jesus appeared as an infant, born of a virgin, lived a life of perfection, died a death on a cross, and these seven sections run until Jesus' second appearing when he comes back, not as an infant, not as the one who's to die, but the one who's to rule and reign, and he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords, and they're going to go through this. So they've got these things on their mind, and they're ready, and chapter 12 opens up the second major section, and what we understand now is that now all of a sudden there's war in heaven. And this isn't about what's happened on planet Earth, chapters 1 through 11. This, this is about the fact that there's a cosmic conflict going on, that everything we walk through, everything that we are engaged in is part of a struggle between God and those that work on his behalf and Hasatan and those who work on his behalf. And there's this cosmic struggle from the beginning of time has taken place. And, and John wants his hearers to understand that in the midst of this struggle, here's the lesson that I think they've learned from chapters 1 through 11. In the midst of this struggle, Pain is inevitable, but misery is always optional. <laughs> Whatever you're walking through today, my friend, there's going to be pain. There's going to be maybe physical pain. There's going to be emotional pain. There's going to be relational pain. There's going to be some spiritual pain. And in the midst of this cosmic battle, pain is inevitable. But misery is always optional. It's your choice. It's your choice whether or not you're going to sit and stew in the anger that's festering inside of you. There's some things that have happened in your anger, and Jesus said in your anger, don't sin. Pain is inevitable. Anger is coming, but, but misery is optional. You, you have a choice in the midst of what you're walking through, whether or not you will offer grace and forgiveness and mercy, or whether you'll hold on to unforgiveness and you'll be judgmental and mean-spirited. You, you have a choice, and so these hearers understand that pain is, in, is inevitable, but, but misery is always optional. So I need you to have that in your mind. I need you to have one other thing in your mind. I need you to have in mind your favorite parody. Your favorite parody. Uh, you know parody, right? Parody is, is uh, a, an imitation 
that's done with extreme exaggeration to accomplish one of three things. It's used to accomplish com- comedic relief. Um, it's, it's used to uh, ridicule. And it's used to deceive. So I need you to have in mind your favorite parody. Uh, for some of you, maybe your favorite parody is that, that wonderful piece of, piece of uh, Mozart's music that's played by uh, kazoos, right? That, that, that's, that's just a parody. For some of you, maybe your favorite parody is the, the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, which is a parody of Homer's work, The Odyssey. Or maybe for some of you, uh, your favorite parody is uh, Tina Fey uh, doing Sarah, Par- Sarah Palin. You know, it's a parody. And, and it's imitation done with extreme exaggeration to bring about comedic, comedic relief to bring about ridicule or to highlight deception. I need you to have that in your mind as you listen to Revelation, what we call chapters 12, 13, 14, and just the start of chapter 15. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Oh, by the way, I, I need to stop because I forgot. Uh, I also need you as you listen um, to listen for the words this calls for. All right? Uh, this calls for because we're understanding that Revelation was not written to promote speculation about the future, but to prompt action in the present. So, so listen for those words. So, so I'll start again and try not to stop this time. I think I've covered it. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Hasatan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard in a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the power and the salvation and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns, and each head, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because they had given uh, authority to the beast, because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast and who can make war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name, his dwelling place, and those who live in heaven. 
It was given power to make war against God's people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they shall, with the sword they shall be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on, beast on its behalf and made the earth and all its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. It performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of everyone. Because of, si- because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. It was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast beast, so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of the beast's name. This calls for wisdom. Let those who have insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, that number is 666. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard the sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like the, that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among the the human race and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people, he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And a second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. And a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, or no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in its image, for anyone who receives the mark of, of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people to keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. And I looked. And there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. And another angel came out of heaven, and came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called out in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. Then the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. And I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. I don't know how it happens, friends. But God's word says, Revelation 1, that because you've heard part of the revelation read, you're blessed. 
you're blessed. I, I don't know exactly how that happens, but that's God's promise. But what I knew, do know is this, that God's promise calls you to do something. Part of the blessing comes not just in reading it out loud or hearing it read, but those who take to heart and do what it says. You've been called to duty. So, so how, do, how do I handle this, understanding this? How do I understand, how do I move through this understanding that, that pain is inevitable, but, but misery is always optional? How, how do I move through this? Well, we, first of all, we move through this, this section of Revelation as ordinary followers of Jesus called to do extraordinary things. Ordinary followers of Jesus called to do extraordinary things. Real people in a real place in a real time. Going through real pain. And it calls for wisdom. The ability to know what's right from what's wrong. It calls for patient endurance. It calls for faithfulness. It calls for, for unapologetic proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It calls for taking a stand. It calls for singing out loud. It calls for something. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. We move through this from Revelation 14 as, as God's elite warriors who understand the cost but who believe the reward is greater. We understand the cost that in that age to take a stand for Jesus Christ it landed the guy who writes this on an island of isolation in Patmos. For those who took a stand for Jesus Christ, they were no longer able to work or buy or sell or get things in the marketplace. Their businesses were being shut down. To take a stand for Jesus Christ and proclaim Jesus is Lord instead of Jesus is Lord, it made you marked. We understand that the cost is great, but we believe that the reward is even greater. We believe that eternity with Jesus and power in his, and time in his presence, we believe that it's greater. And we move through this section understanding that we are victors. Nike, remember Nike? Yeah. And that we conquer, that we win the battle by God's word and for God's glory. Over and over again, I hope you heard in this section that they remained faithful to their testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus never wavered, that we believe he was born of a virgin, lived a life of perfection, that he died on a Roman crucifixion stick, that he, that he was dead, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead so that we could have life. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life. Do not ask us to say Caesar is Lord, for there is only one Lord, and Jesus Christ is his name. And they remained faithful. And what we learn is this, that we fight from victory, and not for victory. And there's some of you in the midst of a struggle and trying to think, I gotta fight this in order to win, my friend. You've already won. And this picture that's painted in Revelation 12, what we call thir- chapter 12, 13, and 14, reminds us that we have already won the victory, that the victory has been won. The victory of Christ and his church has been won. And he wins over the dragon and those that work on his behalf, including the beasts. And so we move through these seven parallel sections of Revelation, and we've, there, there are seven of them, one through three, uh, chapters one through three, chapters four through seven, chapters eight through 11. Now we're chapters 12 through 14, part of 15, and we'll see these seven sections. And they're not chronological. I want you to remember, they're not chronological. It's not like, well, this happens, and this happens, and this happens. There are they're, they're seven different looks at, at the time from when Jesus was born until the time when Jesus comes back. We see it beautifully in this section. Revelation chapter 12, we see that that there was a woman about to give birth to a a male child. And John tips his hand here in verse 5 of chapter 12, and he lets us know that the child's the one who would rule with the iron scepter. You're taking notes, that's a reference back to Psalm 2, one of the the Jewish messianic psalms that points to their coming Messiah. And so, so we know but that's there. So Jesus is first coming as the infant, and then you get to Revelation 14, the one who's on the cloud with a, with a crown of gold who's holding a sickle in his hand. It's Jesus coming back, again, not to be the Savior, but to be the judge and the Lord of the world. So it's this, this beautiful picture. But what John wants us to understand as we move into Revelation 12 through 22 is that there's war going on in heaven. My friend, everything that's happening in your life, everything that you see happening on planet Earth is part of a greater cosmic conflict. It's part of a a battle between God and our enemy. That's why the scriptures say, uh, put on the full armor of God so that you can be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's why the scriptures tell us that your enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour because there's spiritual war. It's, It's why God's word tells us that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds as we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's spiritual warfare going on. That's why the scriptures say, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It's why we're reminded there's this great cosmic conflict, and in the midst of this cosmic conflict, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. You get to to choose. You get to choose how you move through this. And so we're reminded that there's one image of throne, there's one word, Nike, 
And there's one response that's, recall, that's called for worship. Now we're going to see, as we move through these seven miraculous, these seven amazing signs that we've just read, we're going to see that worship involves certain things. Sign number one involved from Revelation chapter 12. It's really all of chapter 12. Sign number one talks about uh, the woman, the child, the dragon, and you. Now let me just very quickly tell you that uh, the woman, I believe, represents God's faithful people throughout the course of time. Uh, some people say that the woman liter- uh, should be interpreted as Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus. In fact, our, our Catholic friends will tell us that that's the interpretation that they hold to, but, but Scripture just doesn't play that out, and to do that elevates Mary to a place that rightfully belongs to Jesus. Uh, some people say it's just, the, it's just the people of the Old Testament, but, but that doesn't play out because what we see is that, is that the enemy, uh, when he began to be poised uh, to strike the child as he's born, um, when that doesn't work, he begins to attack all of God's people throughout the course of time. I believe, my friends, that the, that, uh, the woman represents God's faithful people throughout the course of time, and that includes me and you. And one of the things we're going to understand as we move through this, therefore, is this, that um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the enemy's out to get you. He, he has one desire, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's out to get you. So, so the woman represents God's faithful people. The child, again, John tips his hand as he says it's the one who will rule with the iron shepherd. The child is Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one, the lamb who went to the cross, the one who stands before the throne. He looks like a lamb who's been slaughtered, yet he stands. He's, he's the one who won the victory for you on the cross. And John reminds us that the, that the child is Jesus. And then the dragon, John spells it out for us. The dragon is the, the enemy. He's... Uh, the devil, he's the adversary, he's the accuser, he's the liar, he's the one who leads the world astray. You'll notice on your teaching outline if you follow along, uh, I don't ever capitalize his name. We, we call him Satan with a capital S. That's not his given name. It's Hasatan. It's, it's the adversary. And sometimes we give him more credit than he's rightfully due. And so I just want to remind you in that simple way that, that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, that the one to whom we should honor and the one to whom we should bow is, is Jesus. Jesus. And it's this, it's this picture. But I want you to see from, from this passage of Revelation when it comes to the, to the woman, the child, and the dragon. Uh, look with me at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and I, I want you to see this. Um, r- right here in verse 4. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. And the people who hear this are like, I we get that. We remember the story of his birth. His birth was prophesied, and then his birth came, and angels uh, sang, and shepherds went and worshipped, but, but there were some wise men from, from the east who saw a star, and they followed the star, and, it, and they followed the star till it stopped, and they were trying to find the child, and they went and they asked a king, hey, we've come to see the one who's born king of the Jews. And King Herod got upset because he wanted to be the only king. And he said, we've come to worship him. Can you tell me where he is? He said, no, I can't tell you where he is, but when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can worship him too. But it was a lie because the enemy stood poised and all King Herod wanted to do was to kill the baby because he didn't want anybody to take his place. And so the, the wise men are warned in a dream, don't go back by way of Herod because Herod's got ulterior motives. And so when Herod understands that he's deceived and that he's been, that he's been duped by these wise men, what does he do? He issues a decree that all the baby boys should be killed just so that he can end it. The enemy, the dragon, I've told you before that I think that's the one piece that's missing from every nativity set. There ought to be a bright red dragon breathing fire at that moment because he stood poised and he failed. And the picture is he fails again and again and again and again. And what we understand is that once the enemy couldn't devour the child, he turns on the woman. You have trouble reading through the Old Testament. You think it's boring and I don't get anything out of it. I've listed on your teaching outline uh, just some scripture references, kind of detailing out a little reference point to every period of Old Testament history where you see this again and again and again. Genesis chapter 3, our spiritual parents um, are told, don't eat from that tree. And the enemy says, did God really say that? And our spiritual parents ate, and we've tasted the consequences of their disobedience ever since. And in Genesis chapter 3, 15, it's the very first presentation of the gospel. When God says to the serpent, I'm putting enmity between you and the woman, between you and my faithful people. 
And I'm, I, I, I know you're going to pursue her, but, but they're going to crush you. And it's this picture, and the enemy tries time and time again, and then you see Cain kills Abel. Is God's story going to, going to involve murderers? And then, then all of a sudden, God's going to, going to bring this out through, through Seth. And, and then all of a sudden, there's, there's humanity that's gone wild, and, and a flood comes, and it, it, are God's people going to be saved? And God saves one of the descendants of Seth. His name's Noah and his family. And then by the time you get to Genesis 12, just read through the Old Testament. There's Abraham, and God chooses him, and he's going to give birth to us. They're going to have a son, but his wife can't bear ch- children. She's too old, and all of a sudden they give birth to Isaac. And now all of a sudden God says to Abraham, go kill Isaac. And the enemy's poised right there pursuing God's people. This dream is going to end all the way through the, through the line of King David to where you hear the story that's recorded. You can look it up in Second Chronicles to the story where, the, where one person decides she's going to destroy the entire line of David, and only one boy is rescued with his nurse and they're hidden in a house so that God's line, the enemy is poised. And my friend, I want you to know that the enemy continues to pursue you like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour because he can't pursue the child anymore because Jesus won. And it says, look at that. Look at that. Where did it go? Um, Chapter 12, I want to see verse like 12. There it is. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short he's going to keep working because he knows Jesus is coming back and that Jesus wins. And until then, he's not going to give up. And he's after you and he's after me. My friend, I want you to see that Satan has been conquered by Christ, but he continues to be conquered by Christ's people. Even in the midst as they suffer. Look what it says there in verse 11. They, that's you and me, they triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. My friend, this calls for obedience to the word and proclamation of the word. We have to be obedient to what God said. That's our response in worship. Uh, Then you get to chapter 13. Chapter 13 opens up with the dragon who's frustrated, who's in a fury, who's in rage, and he's standing by the sea. Now to all of the Jewish followers, they know what's coming next. Because by the sea, what happens in the sea according to to Jewish literature? Beasts rise up out of the sea. So it's not going to take them by surprise when all of a sudden the beast of the sea rises up. And this beast of the sea rises up, and some people want to know, well, is it a real person? Is it a place? I, I believe that the, the, the beast of the sea represents anti-Christian persecution. I believe it represents anti-Christian persecution, that the beast represents the evil spirit behind earthly systems. Um, God gives the beast, as you read through this passage, God gives the beast permission to curse his name, to crush his people, and to control the nations. Let me say that again. To curse his name, to crush his people, and to control the nations. I, I just, I just want to say a word to you. Um, this is a reminder that you should never expect your government to act Christian. It won't. Um, If you're putting your hope in a government, you're putting your hope in the wrong place. If you're putting your hope in a political party, you're putting your hope in the wrong place. Because the world does not have on its mind the intentions of Christ. This is is anti-Christian persecution. What you see there on your outline is that I believe that that the, the, the enemy, the adversary, Hasatan, works through governments that begin to proclaim themselves as divine authority instead of those under divine authority. And I would challenge you to find a government on the planet that truly and honestly is functioning as under divine authority. Don't put your hope, don't expect your government to work that way. Look look what it says. It says, um, they hold fast, they hold fast the word of God and his testimony My friend, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness. That's what it says. It says this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness. Um, If you're a follower of Jesus, especially in America at this point, and and you're starting to get frustrated that uh, Christians are being uh, characterized as intolerant, that Christians are being characterized as uh, unloving, uncaring, uncompassionate, if you're, if you're frustrated with that, I, I want you to know that you shouldn't expect anything less. I, I believe that to those who first heard this, this anti-Christian persecution would stand out as, as, as Rome itself. 
It would stand out as Rome itself as the persecuting Christians. Uh, there was a Roman senator, his name was Tacitus, and he, he wrote a volume of the history of Rome uh, that covered, began really broken down into two, two, volume, or two uh, books. Uh, maybe the most famous is a book called The Annals. And in The Annals, he talks about the movement of Christ. The Annals covers uh, 14 AD to about 68 AD. And, and, and he talks about a man named Christ that proclaimed to be God's son, that was crucified under Pontius Pilate. As he tells the story about Christians and their continued growth and the movement that's now spread to Rome, you get to the time of Nero when, when, when Rome is burned. Remember, somebody say Rome burned while Nero fiddled or whatever. And so, uh, but Rome's on fire and Nero doesn't want to take the blame, so Nero figures out how he can accuse the Christians. And Tacitus has this really interesting thing to say, about Christians, and I, I want you to see this because I don't want you to be surprised that you're being referred to as intolerant and uncompassionate and unloving. Look how Tacitus refers to Christians. He says this, a great multitude of Christians were convicted of the fire of Rome, not so much for the firing of the city as for being haters of humanity. Tacitus, the Annals, volume 15, pages 44 and 45. For a long time, there's been anti-Christian persecution, and we should expect nothing less. We should expect nothing less. The dragon, the beast of the sea, now is the picture of the beast of the earth. And I, I, would, I would say that I think the beast of the earth represents anti-religious, uh, anti or anti-Christian religion. I, I think it's, it's Rome and those who act on their behalf and all of the people that manage the world on behalf of this great Roman Empire. And if you want not to be destroyed, you have to walk through uh, the city. Uh, you want to buy something. You want to sell something. You have to proclaim Caesar is Lord. And, and they make you say things that would go contrary. And if you don't, you can't buy, you can't sell. I, I believe it's anti-Christian religion. I, I believe it's deception. I believe this is the, the greatest picture of parody here. Remember, parody is something that's imitation that's done with extreme exaggeration for the pur purpose of comedic relief, uh, for the purpose of being ridiculing, and for the, for the purpose of deception. And, and John engages here. I want you to see this with me. This is, this is amazing. Um, this is deception. Um, I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. It, it's not the lamb, but, but it poses as the lamb. It's not the one who's died for you, but it poses as the one who can rescue you. Um, it exercised all the authority of the beast on its behalf. It made the earth and all of its habits. Worship the first beast. By, by the way, would you notice that worship, what you worship is becoming the, the defining line? Don't get caught up in the imagery. Don't get caught up in all of the, the symbols. Don't get caught up in all of the numbers. Uh, understand this, that every human being John wants us to understand every human being will make a choice. You will choose to worship either the true lamb that was slain yet is standing or, or the one that claims to be something that it's not. Worship is becoming the dividing line. And the beast is given the ability to, to massacre all who refuse to worship him and to mark all who follow him. Look at, look at the parody. I, I, I love how this plays out. It performed great signs, even causing, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of the people. And it's going to remind them of their prophet. Who was able to call down fire from heaven? The pagans? No. Only the prophet of God could call down fire from heaven. Only God delivers fire from heaven. It's parody. The beast claims to be something that's not. Um, because of the signs it was given power to perform the place, it deceived the inhabitants of all the earth. Check this out. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. It's parody. This beast had not been wounded by the sword yet lived. Its wound had not been healed. There's only one beast that had been wounded by the sword. There's only one beast who had a, a death blow given to it. There's only one beast, there's only one lamb that, that resurrected from the dead, and his name was Jesus. Not, not this parody, not, not this beast, only, only Jesus. And it, it says this, um, Verse 15, the, be the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast. <laughs> it's parody. Who alone can breathe breath of life into some body? God himself, God breathes and things happen. And this, this is parody. It's like, no, 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 no. It's pretending to be something. And I think John writes, my friends, I think John writes with, with this parody for the purpose of bringing those who are followers of Jesus a bit of comedic relief. 
<laughs> I think they laugh. I think this is filled with laugh lines. As they hear it and as they, as they marvel at how ludicrous this is. <laughs> they're pretending to be something they're not. How absurd is that? And I think they laugh. I think John writes parody for the, for the purpose of ridicule. Because he can ridicule the Roman government. And he can say things that he can't say outright. Uh, because if they get caught with this letter in their hand, they're going to die. And I think he, he writes for ridicule. But I think he also writes this parody as a reminder that that one who claims to be the lamb but is not is simply trying to deceive you. Which leaves me for a question. With the question, is there anything in your life that you are treating as real but the reality of it is it's fake? Is there anything in your life that you're treating that, that's deceived you and you're treating that like it's real, but the reality of it is it's fake. If there is, you, you need to take it to the cross and understand what's real, and what's real is the victory. This, my friends, it says, calls for wisdom. <laughs> the ability, God's given you the ability to distinguish between what's real and what's fake. God's given you the ability to determine what's right and what's wrong. God's given you the ability to determine what's evil and what's holy. It calls for wisdom to, to judge and evaluate and, and live a holy life. God's given you that ability. Would you notice the greatest parody of all, I think, so far that we've seen is the unholy trinity, the dragon, the beast of the sea, and the beast of the earth compared to the true trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And John writes, and it calls for wisdom. Maybe the greatest parody of all is the number 666. Uh, read commentaries, read interpretations, read things that are scholarly, read things that aren't scholarly. People have found a way to make 666 mean just about everything they wanted it to mean. You read through some of it, uh, people have made 666 to be Adolf Hitler. They made it to be Joseph Stalin. They made it to be George W. Bush. They made it to be Ronald Reagan. They made it to be Bill Clinton. They made it to be Barack Obama. There are all kinds of interpretations. I, I would submit to you that this is the greatest period of all because it is the number that falls once short three times over. The number of perfection is seven. Representing the Trinity, seven, seven, seven. Representing failure over and over and over again, six, six, six. It's the greatest number that falls one short many times over. Every time it tries, it fails, and it calls for wisdom. The next picture, chapter 14, one through five, is the picture of elite warriors who put victory into practice. Then I saw the lamb, chapter 14 opens up. By the way, all of that's parody. Then he says, then I looked, and there before me was the lamb. Not one like a lamb, but the lamb. Not the parody, not the fake, not the deception, but the real thing. And he's standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000, the elite soldiers who had his name and the Father's name written on their foreheads. By the way, would you just notice with me that those who had 666 on their hand or on their forehead, it was called a mark. In chapter 7 of Revelation, what did we see as the, those who had the name of God on their forehead? Not a mark, but a seal. And there's a huge difference. That they're protected, that they're cared for, that God's one. And notice the difference. And so they have the mark. And there's a sound from heaven. And I want you to zero in with me at verse 4. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It's not saying that you and I need to abstain from sex on planet Earth. It's a picture that God's warriors are always ready for battle. That they won't let anything stand in their way. Remember the story of King David? He committed adultery with Bathsheba, another man's wife. He was a warrior. He was out in the field, and David said, I know how I'm going to get past this. I'm going to bring him back from the battlefield. I'm going to ask him a question. I'm going to say, go in tonight. Before you go back to the battlefield, spend the night with your wife. He's going to find out that she's pregnant. He's going to do the math. Oh, that's probably the night I was home from the war. But the soldier had so much integrity that he wouldn't even go into his wife's bedroom. He slept outside the door. Remember the story? And it's that picture that God's warriors are always ready for battle. And that's the picture here. That's the picture here that we're permanently ready for battle, that we're ready to stand boldly with Christ, sing loudly to Christ, and be satisfied only in Christ. Notice what it says. It says, no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Following the lamb means rejecting the lie every single time. My friends, there are some of you who are struggling right here, right now. You're believing the lie. You're believing the lie that Satan's telling you that you're never going to be strong enough, fast enough, smart enough, pretty enough, that you're never going to be good enough, that God can't love somebody like you, and the enemy's lying, 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 and he tells us the same lie. He has this uncanny ability of telling us one line that plays like a tape recorder over and over and over and over and over and over again in our head. And to be victorious, that means you reject the lie every single time because your enemy, the adversary, who's out to get you is the father of lies and he wants to destroy you. Reject the lie. 
brother, reject the lie. Sister, this calls for holy living. Uncompromising purity an unapologetic proclamation of the gospel. Can I share with you the gospel? Because maybe that's the decision you need to make today. The gospel very simply is this, that God wants a relationship with you. And the only way you can have that relationship with God is through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That you need to accept what Jesus has done. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. Uh, I had a chance to travel overseas with my dad and brother on one occasion we were going to Brazil to do uh, to peacock fish for peacock bass and uh, we went through Miami and we had a layover in Miami on the way down and um, uh, my dad and brother who traveled more than I did uh, they said hey let's go into the I didn't even know these things existed there evidently there's these these mysterious marvelous airplane clubs that exist behind these magical doors and if you walk through them, they're big, comfy couches and, and chairs. And the one that was there had this huge buffet filled with all the food you could eat for, for no fee and all the drinks that you could drink. And so we walked in, and my dad shows them his credentials, and he walks in. My brother walks in and shows them his credentials, and I'm standing there, and the lady asks to see my credentials. I don't have anything. I don't have anything to present her. And she says to me, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, you don't have the credentials to get in here. At which point, my brother, my big brother, uh, looked at her and said, that's okay, he's with me. And she said, go on in. I mean, that's the picture of heaven. One day, this is the gospel. One day, every single human being, don't get caught up in the details, don't get caught up in the imagery, don't get caught up in the numerology, don't get caught up in the red dragon and the beast of the sea. The picture is this, and these people got it. One day, every single human being will stand in front of a holy God, and he will say to you, why should I let you in? And the only response we can have is, I don't have the credentials to get in here. And at that point, we are dependent on our big brother, Jesus, to stand in our behalf and say, that's okay, Dad, he's with me. He put his trust in me. He has full access to everything that is in heaven because he put his trust in me. She put her trust in me. She believed that I was the one who was the lamb who died, yet stands because I conquered the death. Because I conquered death. My friend, have you ever come to the place where you said, Jesus, I'm relying on your credentials and not my own to get you in to heaven? If you never have, don't miss the point of the story. You have a choice to make. That's why we go on to chapter 14, verses 6 through 10, and we see three angels who worship God alone. And what we see here is they, they call out uh, uh, to, to worship God, to fear God. And we've seen that, that who I worship on earth determines where I go in eternity. The choice I make about Jesus and what he did and to say, I have a choice to make. I will follow the true lamb and not this thing that is nothing but a parody, nothing but a deception. Nothing but that which should bring me comedic relief. Notice this. This, this section just very simply says, worship God alone. He's going to sort everything out. And then it says this, and I, and I want you to see this. Chapter 14. He, he, he calls out and he says, uh, woe, woe to Babylon. Woe to Babylon, verse, uh, verse 8, chapter 14, verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, my friend. Uh, Babylon is always presented in the scripture as that entity which tries to, to sway you and tries to turn you uh, with its immorality and idolatry. And I want you to hear this as your pastor who loves you. I want to say a word to every middle school student, every high school student, every single person, every, every married person, every divorced person. I want to say a word to every single one of you. Babylon is trying to sway you. And you need to know, based on the authority of God's word, that if you pursue what Babylon has to offer, you will drink nothing but the wrath of God. And I want you to know that I know just one of the things God helps pastors to know. I know that some of you are tiptoeing and some of you are moving down the path of Babylon. And you're toying with the things that are nothing but a parody. They're toying with the things that aren't real. You're toying with the things that are deception. And God says to you, repent, stop, come back, follow me. My friend, Babylon's intoxicating efforts will fail every single time. She fails. Fallen, fallen. This calls for patience. The sixth vision is about reaping the harvest, the one who's sitting on the cloud. And I would simply say that he harvests first the wheat and then the angel says harvest the grapes. I would remind you that this just is a reminder, don't miss the picture, that the judgment of God is inevitable and the judgment of God is intense. 
And God's time will come when he will harvest those who trust him and he will tread on those who've turned from him. We don't like to talk about that that is the choice. That is the choice, my friend, but this calls for a decision. Don't get lost in the pictures. Don't get lost in the numbers. Don't get lost in the imagery and miss the point. The people who heard this read for the first time would understand this is decision time. You have a choice. I will follow one of two things. I will either follow Christ Jesus or I will follow the one who presents themselves as something they are not. It calls for a decision now. Because you see, it's really about who you follow. Revelation 13, 3 says, the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. But Revelation 14, 4 says, there's a group of people who simply say, we'll follow the lamb wherever he goes. Your choice. And then ultimately, folks, uh, team, if you want to come back up, chapter 15 opens, and it's a picture of praise. It's the song of the redeemed. And they stand, and they sing, and they praise in front of God. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been, what? Revealed. Hey, we didn't miss the picture. Now it's time to praise God. God challenges us to consider his incomprehensible works and shout out loud at the top of our voice, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God tells us to behold his incomparable worth and sing with all that we have, worthy is the lamb that was slain. My friends, this calls for praise and worship. This calls for praise and worship. And I want to give us a chance to do that. Uh, We're going to invite you to stand and we're going to invite you to sing. But more than that, we're going to invite you to respond. God has spoken to you. This teaching calls for something from you. What is God calling you to do right here, right now? Would you stand with us and would you worship and praise the one and the only one who is God?